What a wonderful time it is to be in the presence of God. Yeah. This whole week, I was wondering, you know, like, God, what are you, what are you doing in our church? Where, what is our, our mission? Where are we going from here? And then I come in this morning, and he gives the answer to that, okay? You know, when we got here this morning, we, you know, we do our rehearsal, and every song, every song spoke about heaven coming down about being in the presence of Jesus, about being in his presence, okay? We came unwanting, but knowing that he is fully and utterly deserving of worship and praise. All the songs like that they're gonna be singing are going to touch your heart. It's gonna touch your heart in the core. I want you to think about that. I want, you to think, I want you to think about being in the presence of Jesus, that encounter, having Jesus. If you haven't had a Jesus encounter, then you may not know what I'm talking about. But those who have had Jesus impact their lives, those who have had Jesus change their lives, change them from who they once used to be to who they are now. I know Christ has had such an impact on my life. 
I know Christ has had such an impact on so many others in the sanctuary's life right now. I know so many who have been impacted by Christ just in this past two years. I know many that have been impacted by Christ just this morning, okay? Our uh, very own Jesse McCorkle is going to be bringing the word today. That, is an, that, that right there shows where we're going, right there. Natalie, Natalie is going to be having her second baby in two days, and she's playing on the keys today. That is the act of Christ. Such, so many things to bless. They got their whole family here, okay? We have Pastor Trevor in the back giving honor to him. Pastor Rob in the, in the sanctuary. God's doing a miraculous thing here. All right. Lord God, we thank you and we love you. And Lord God, we're going to worship you today, Lord God. We believe you for everything that you're doing, Lord God, and everything that you're going to do. No words can express the love we have for you, Lord God.
Sufficient for me. 
the band softly plays, could you just lift up your own prayer to the Lord? Could you lift up your own wants and your desires to the Lord and say, Father, I just need more of you, God. Lord, I can't do this without more of you, Father. So Lord, would you just come and invade this place, Father? Yeah, just lift up your own voice right now. that's been holding you back from giving your all to God, from giving whether it's your life, whether it's your worship, whether it's anything that, that, is, that you are keeping from God, that you know you're keeping from God. Out of fear, out of hurt, out of disappointment, out of offense, whatever the case may be, it's time to throw the fears into the wind and open up our hearts again to what he wants to do in our lives. And that's for us individually, that's for us corporately as a church. We cannot live in fear anymore. We cannot live in bondage anymore. We have to throw it all aside to chase him fully and to follow the call that he has on our lives fully. Otherwise, it's just baggage that's weighing us down as we're trying to get to him, as we're trying to fulfill our life here on earth. Lord God, we are desperate yeah. for a touch yeah. from you to set us free from all of that bondage, to set us free from the fears. We throw them to the wind. They no longer are weighing down on our shoulders anymore. We cast them aside. The enemy has no victory. He has been defeated. He is under our feet. He has been cast out into the wind, away from this church, away from our hearts, away from our minds just where he belongs. The enemy has no hold in this church. The enemy has no hold anymore over every single person that's in this building right now, every single person that maybe isn't here right now that calls this church home. The enemy has no hold in Jesus' name. He has to flee. He has to flee. Desperate for a time. 
Tears in my eyes I just lift my hands Let my heart dance with you Sing over me And I'll lift my hands Let my heart dance with you You take the Sing over me, dance over me, and I'll dance with you. Just with you. Oh Lord, it has been heaven basking in your presence this morning, Lord God. It's all we want, Lord. It's all we want. It's why we're here. It's why we come in your presence, Lord, together. We want to experience you. We want to experience your ways. We want to experience your thoughts, Lord God. We want everything we are to line up with you and your kingdom, God. That's all we want. And we know, Lord, that when we come into your presence, that it is all just downloaded into us, Lord. We can't help it, Lord God. We are opening our hearts to you today. We open our hearts to all that you have. We open our hearts to the word that's going to be delivered from you today, God. We bless you, Jesus. We give it all to you. We're surrendered completely to you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, welcome to Crossroads. with Crossroads Community Church, and here is what's happening for June. Remember to contact us at cccthisishome at gmail.com. And as always, we look forward to seeing you soon. I am not Jesse McCorkle. Surprise. Hey, real quick, Larry asked if I would introduce Jesse. You're asking, Pastor Jeff, you're supposed to be on vacation. What are you doing here? That's right. There's no better place to be than home. And uh, yes, we are supposed to be on vacation, but we did not want to miss out of being home, worshiping with our church family and being here with you today. So that is why we're here. But I'm excited to see and be a part of Jesse's, what he's got to bring to us today. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we just worship you today. 
Holy Spirit, begin to tear down walls. Open our ears to hear whatever you've laid on Jesse's heart right now. I pray that your spirit will anoint his tongue and his tongue will penetrate every wall and barrier that we've built up so we can leave here differently. And that's more like you and less like us. Father, we honor this man, Jesse, today. Speak through him. We love him. We honor him. We're thankful for him. And all God's people said amen. Amen. Jesse. Hello? Yeah. Hey, you know what? It's not the sound people's fault. Nine times out of 10, it's our own. I said to my dad like a month ago, I'm like, well, I'm teaching in June. And he's like, I'll cancel some stuff to make sure I'm there. I'm like, please don't. You know? Like, please don't. Um, you know, we've been talking for about eight to 10 weeks about identity and identity crisis, and Jeff and Josh and Eric have all taught incredible messages, and I'm honored to be a part of the lineup teaching about identity, and uh, I just want to honor Eric for being vulnerable last week. He, he talked about some stuff that I don't think a lot of us would really want to talk about in our own life, and um, it's through that vulnerability that we have freedom. And I've watched as we've done Celebrate Recovery, and we've sat in circles, and we've talked about how a mess we are. And when we give a platform for confession and on honesty and vulnerability, I think it brings freedom. And I've watched over the last 10 weeks um, our church become free because we're just vulnerable with each other. Am I alone in that? Um, I'm going to try to get through this. I, uh, I want to, I want to start today. I'm talking about the lie we all believe. And, um, I've, I've heard us talk about lies and, and how we, um, fall prey to the voice of the enemy. And each and every week I'm thinking, why is it there? Why is it there? Why is it there? And I want to talk about that lie. I want to talk about the, the reasons why we, fall into identity issues as Christians. I turned 30 yesterday, and uh, I've been in the church my, all my life, and I have myself gone through cycles as Christians, and I have watched other Christians go through the same cycles, and it's unnecessary, but it's something that I've watched us all do, and so I want to read in Ephesians. I'm a little hot, I think, um, on my mic. But I want to read in Ephesians. I, I call this, I'm going to flip through it. No one has to read this, but I call this the heart of the Father. I, uh, this is the blueprint out of Ephesians that I think when God created man, he intended, he did, and he did not intend, he wrote this on our heart. And so no one has to, no one has to read this. I'm just going to read through this. This is out of Ephesians 1. This is the heart of the Father. So when you hear me read this, this is the blueprint for the kingdom. Every spiritual blessing in heaven has already been lavished upon us as a love gift from our wonderful Heavenly Father, the Father, our Lord Jesus, all because he sees us wrapped into Christ. He cannot see Christ without seeing us. This is why we celebrate him with all of our hearts. He chose us to be his very own, joining himself even before he laid the foundations of the universe. Because of this great love, he ordained us so that we would be seen holy in his eyes, in unstained innocence. For it is, for it was always in his perfect plan to adopt us, his delightful children, though our union with Jesus, the anointed one, so that his tr tremendous love that cascades over us would glorify his grace. So now we are joined to Christ we have been given treasures of redemption by his blood, the total cancellation of our sins, all because of his cascading riches of his grace. This superabundant grace is already powerfully working in us. 
releasing within us all forms of wisdom and practical understanding. Before we were even born, he gave us destiny. Then your lives will be an advertisement of this immense power as it works through you. This is the mighty power which was released when God raised Christ from the dead. God has put everything beneath the authority of Jesus and has given him the highest rank above all others. Now listen, and we are now his church and are his body on earth. The authority is ours. He raised us up with Christ, exalted the exalted one, and we ascended with him into glorious perfection and authority of the heavenly realm. Everything is new. Although you were once distant and far away from God, now you have been brought delightfully close to him. Through the sacred blood of Jesus, you actually have been united with Christ. This means God is transforming each of you into the holy of holies, his dwelling place through the power of of the Holy Spirit living in you. We have boldness through him and free access as kings before the Father because of our complete confidence in Christ's faithfulness. That's pretty good. I'm going to be in Genesis. Genesis 1. I figure, I didn't really know what to teach, so I figure if I just read the whole Bible, I can teach it all. So... I hope you guys have water, because I'm starting in Genesis 1, and I'm in Revelation. It'll probably take six days. My, the only preparation I did is I download how to read the, the Bible in one year, and I'm just going to do it, try to do it in an hour. Okay. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. The Bible said that God covered the face of the earth. It was void. Am I allowed to get this close, Larry? Is it, am I going to ring? Oh, I'm good. All right. I'm not going to go through all the creations, but God spoke into existence by a command everything that we see around us. In verse 26, God said, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. That was not a command. For the first time, it was universal agreement. Let us. It was a, the Trinity was coming together saying, We are going to lean in. And create mankind. Some verses, additional verses that I think that maybe God wrote on the heart of Adam as he was creating Adam, the DNA in Adam. Psalms 139, 13 through 16. You form my innermost being, shape my delicate insides, my intricate outside, and wove them all together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, for making me so complex. Everything you do is marvelously breathtaking. It simply amazes me to think about how thoroughly you know me, God. You formed every bone in my body. You created me in a secret place. Carefully, skillfully, you shaped me from something or from nothing to something. You who created me before I became me, before I'd ever see the light of day, the number of days you planned for me were already recorded in my book. Titus 3, 5, he came to save us, not because of any virtuous deed we've, we've done, but only because of his extravagant mercy. Isn't that nice? He saved us, resurrecting us through the washing of rebirth. We are completely new by the Holy Spirit, whom he splashed all over us richly. By Jesus, the Messiah, our life giver, so as a gift of his love. And since we are faultless, innocent before his face, we can now become heirs of all things, all because of an overflowing hope of eternal life. Psalms 42, 8, all through the day Yahweh has commanded his endless love to pour over me. We don't think about those things. Isaiah 54, 10, even if mountains were to crumble and the hills disappear, my heart's steadfast, faithful love would never leave you, and my covenant of peace with you would never be shaken, says Yahweh, whose love and compassion will never give up. It said in 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Then God said, behold, I have given every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, every tree which is, has fruit yielding seed. It shall be food for you and to every beast on earth and every bird in the sky moves on earth, which has life. I have given you. 31, God saw that he, what he had made, and behold, it was very good. There is a moment in history where God looked at you, each one of you, and said, this is good. 
There's a moment where God looked at your heart and your body and your mind and your emotions and said, this is good. I remember when we had Isla, we're about to have another one in three days, and I remember holding Isla, and she had no purpose on earth yet. She couldn't help herself. She was um, insufficient by her own doings. She was completely helpless. And as I held her, I thought to myself, there is such value in what I'm holding. If you've ever held a child, you know such value. They, they're completely, they're helpless. They have nothing. They provide nothing. They're a liability. But dang, so much value. And something, something happens, something happens when we turn 25 or 20. <sighs> the world just beats us down. And we can hold a child and say it has value, but boy, we can't say it to ourselves. We have to learn to be delighted in our existence. As God looked at us and said, I'm delighted in mankind. I was getting my hair cut from Greg, what's left of it. He keeps cutting it all off. And Greg, I was talking to Greg about this. I was pretty much teaching my message. He's probably like, I don't even gotta come on Sunday now. (laughs) And I said, Greg, what would happen if we delighted in ourselves the way God, everything I just read in Ephesians, what if we delighted in ourselves the way God did that? But John 10.10 10 says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. 1 Peter 5.8 says that the enemy is like a lion, seeking who he may devour. Aiden, come here real quick, buddy. Am I allowed down here, Larry? Okay, I don't know. Stand right behind me. Come here. Oh, shoot. Well, I'm going to walk around. Stand right here behind me, real close, real close. See, the Bible says, 1 Peter 5, 8, your enemy, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion, looking for someone who he may devour. Now, stay with me as I walk, no matter what. Just stay real close to me. When I woke up this morning, I woke up, and I had anxiety. I said, I have to teach today, and I don't want to teach. I was afraid to teach. Do you know why I was afraid? Because while I was sleeping, the enemy was doing this. He was whispering in my ear, and he was talking to me, and he was saying, you're unprepared, you can't do this. Nobody wants to listen. It's not good. And the enemy was right there. And and the Lord was with me, but see, the enemy, through legal access, has the ability to do this right here. Always, when you're at the doctors, when you're at the store, when you're with your family, no matter what, he is always talking. We can take a break on the Lord, but the enemy will never stop speaking to our, our ear. Convoluting, thank you, thank you, Aiden. Convoluting, and making it worse than what it really is. And so we know this. The enemy's number one lie is to contradict the word of God. Check this out. Verse 25, the Bible said, and the man and his wife were both naked, but they were not ashamed. It means they were vulnerable. They were in their perfect form that God had created them. And they weren't ashamed of it. Let's look at three lies. We know this. The enemy came to Eve. And in Genesis 3.1, the enemy says this. So God said, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden. You know what that lie is? Lie number one. You're forgotten. I can't believe it. All this good stuff, you're missing out. You're left behind. God has something for everyone else but you. God is good, just not for you. You ever heard that? Now, Eve was smart. She was like, I thought you had me in the first round, not gonna lie. She came back, she's like, no, 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 no. God said that I can eat from any tree, but if I eat this from this one tree, I'll die. Line number two, direct contradiction to what God had said. He said, you will surely not die. Line number two, doubt God's word, doubt God's power, doubt God's relevance in your life.
Well, God has power for them. God's going to make it through for them. But for you, you're left behind. There's something wrong with you, and God's power isn't relevant in your life. Genesis 3, 4. If you eat the fruit, you will be like God. You know what's interesting about that? She was already like God. Everything I just read in Ephesians, everything that I just got done reading, the intentionality and the DNA that God birthed onto Eve, and he said, if you eat the fruit, this lie is, you fall short, you're not good enough. You're not near to who God says you're supposed to be. You need to do more to be like God. If you were really like God, it would look like this. We know in our heart it's a lie, but I was talking to Greg, and I was saying, it seems so real when he's talking to us, though. So Eve bought the lie. She believed it. Genesis 3, 7 says, the eyes of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Genesis 2, 25, it said that they were naked and felt no shame. Now their eyes were opened. Do you know what open eyes means? They discovered self-consciousness, insecurity. Look at the definition. For the first time in the history of the world, man became self-conscious. Feeling undue awareness of oneself, one's appearance, or one action. Self-consciousness is a heightened sense of awareness of oneself. Self-consciousness is being preoccupied with oneself, especially how others may perceive one's appearance or actions. You know what they felt? Shame. For the first time ever, they had felt shame. When the truth was all of heaven and all of God felt completely differently. At no point did the heart of God feel differently about them. Sin was present, but God's heart never changed. They didn't believe that. We should not change our heart towards ourselves. This is why we have books on psychological development, on self-esteem. You know what self-esteem is? Self-esteem is the reputation we acquire with ourselves. It's our headspace identity. A lot of times, we don't even know we're feeling it. Rhetorical question, what is your mental reputation for yourself? Do you feel appropriate for life? This changed Adam and Eve emotionally, physically, and spiritually. They emotionally felt shame, but they began to make decisions based on their feeling. It said in seven, then the eyes of them were both opened and they knew that they were naked and so they physically made decisions. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin covering and then they spiritually separated themselves from God. You know the enemy will say that it's your decisions that separate you from God? It's our decision to believe the lie of the enemy. I love this. God created a perfect system and man destroyed it just in a few, I don't know how long, a few hours, I don't know. In God's response was he searched for man on man's level once again like a good father. It said in verse 8, they heard the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God in the trees of the garden. How sad. Then the Lord called out to man and said, Where are you? Where are you? See, I think God is walking through our houses, and he's in the car, and he's in the church. I think he's saying to us, Where are you? Everything you're feeling, everything you're thinking, is so against my heart. This isn't me doing it. You've believed a lie. Where are you? Look what Adam said in verse 10. 
He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. I was afraid because I was ashamed of who I was. For 30 years I've read this and I thought that they hid from God because of sin. They didn't hide because of sin, they hide because they didn't like who they were anymore. They were ashamed of themselves, they were self-conscious, they were hurt by their existence. They stopped delighting them in God. And see, I don't think, I don't think we tell God Next slide. I don't think we tell God that we're ashamed, but every day we make emotional, mental, physical, and sometimes subconscious decisions that make the declaration of the lie that we are worthless. We continually contemplate our value, which have, should have never been up for debate. Do you know the moment that you begin to debate your value, you've already lost because your value was never up for debate? Genesis 3, 13, Eve responded to the Lord, the serpent deceived me. I was deceived. We all are deceived. You see, I don't, I don't think we tell God. I hate myself. I don't think we tell God I'm ashamed of who I am. But I think we get up in the morning and we doubt what we're about to do. Declaration. I think we look t- two or three times in the mirror because we don't like what we look like. Declaration. We get in a car that we don't like because it's not as nice as our neighbors and for some reason it matters, declaration. We turn on the radio because silence crushes us, declaration. We sit in rooms and meetings with people that we're intimidated by because we've never felt as good as them. We never tell God, I'm ashamed of who I am, but we make a lot of decisions that tell God, I'm ashamed of who I am. Every single day, look at the next slide. All of life resonates the lie from the enemy. One more car, if you buy this grill, if I could get this promotion, one, if I could look like this person, one more sexual experience, one more like on Facebook, everything on TV, internet, magazines continually rebound the lie that you have to do better, you have to do something outside of just existing to be like God. All of life rebounds this every day when we get up. It's driven into our subconscious now. We're making subconscious decisions. We go into defense mode. And in the process, we defend ourselves from God, who's walking on our level. Look at God's response. Verse 10, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid of myself, so I was hid myself, and the Lord said this. Who told you you were naked? Who told you to think that way? Who told you to think that way? The great lie from the enemy is that we, the perfect pinnacle of God's perfect creation, are flawed question. Where are you prone to this thinking, and how does it change your thought life, your behavior? Satan did this to Jesus in the garden, and Luke, same lies. If you were really the son of God, it's crazy if if you were really the son of God, if God wouldn't have forgotten about you in the desert, you would be able to tur- turn these stones into bread. If, if you really mattered, if, you really, if, you, if God didn't forget about you, you could do it. Doesn't your Bible say that your angels will catch you? I too, doubting God's word. Doesn't it say that if, if, if you would jump, your angels would catch you? Lie number three. If you really wanted to be fulfilled as the son of God, if you wanted to be like God, you're missing it, Jesus. If you wanted to be like God, look around. 
This is what it is to be like God. Same lies. Jesus replied in 12, it's also written, how dare you provoke the Lord your God. That silenced the devil's harassment for a long time. So he retreated into an opportune time, just like Aiden walking behind me. He'll lay off a second, and we'll lay off for a second. And then he has you. And then I love verse 14. It says, Jesus, armed with the Holy Spirit's power, returned to Galilee. Why did Jesus leave the desert after facing the same situation empowered by the Holy Spirit, though? What was different? How did he go through something that the Bible says the Holy Spirit led him into the desert, so he was obeying the Lord, got punched in the teeth three times, and then walked out of that situation filled with the Holy Spirit, because he didn't believe the lie. We walk through things constantly in life that will challenge the identity in our heart. And if we believe, we will go into situations that the Lord says life will have for us, and we will leave every single one of them without power. We will leave every single one of them weaker than when we went in because we believe the lie from the enemy. God has ultimate power, but we have to let him in. We must shift our thinking. Remember the beginning of the message, the original design in Ephesians, this is the heart of God. This is, this is truth. We must learn to look at ourselves through heaven's eyes. Check this out. Romans 12.2. Stop imitating the ideals and the opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life. This is what Jesus did. He transformed the way he thinked. This lie was just as relevant, but he did not allow himself to think differently. Proverbs 4.23, carefully guard your thoughts because they are the source of true life, 2 Corinthians 10.2, but when they measure and evaluate themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they have no understanding. Do you know what that means? You're double-minded. Their loyalty, James 1.8 says, is divided between God and the world. They are unstable in everything that they do. It's like... I talked about this before. For 30 years, I've read hot versus cold, and I feel pressure to feel hot. That's not what the Bible says. God says, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, you know what it means? Which side's hot? I know where I need to be, and I know I'm not there, but I sure as heck don't want to admit where I am. Can't get honest with God. So you know where that leaves you? Nowhere. It leaves you stuck in the middle. And I, I, I myself have done this, and I've watched brothers and sisters constantly do this. The Bible says I'd rather be hot. You know why? Because God has grace and mercy for when we're hot and he died, on the, died on the cross while we were still sinners. He has power over our cold. He can, he can change us. But you know what he can't change? He can't change a man that's deceiving himself, that doesn't want to do anything. I'm just going to not do anything. Self-acceptance does not deny reality, but searches for the why. It embraces who we are as Jesus did. We cannot forgive ourselves for an action that we do not acknowledge that we have taken. Adam went as far as blaming Eve for the sin. He couldn't get out of it. The fruit of not valuing oneself is ultimately self-deception. We sing songs. We sit in messages, and we try not to cuss. All the while, we're just deceiving ourselves. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. That's believing the lie. Okay. Three things. There's a lot of symptoms that we've talked about the last 10 weeks on identity. Three symptoms that I see most prevalent from believing the lie. Symptom number one, short-sightedness. I'm going to read this quick. Second Peter, 
You don't have to read it. Second Peter 1. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him. He called us by his own glory and excellence. I love that God did not create a separate glory and excellence, but he created us in his own glory and excellence. For by these things he has granted to us precious and magnificent promises so that we by them can become partakers of divine nature. Don't even have time to read or, or dig into that. Then he lists off, th- let's call what I'm about to list off just like the appropriate response to conflict or trials that we're walking through. He says, now for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence in your excellence, knowledge in your knowledge, self-control in your self-control, perseverance in your perseverance, godliness, and your godliness, brotherly kindness, and your brotherly kindness, love, For if these qualities are yours and they are increasing, they render you neither useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and the expansion of the kingdom. Love it. Then look what he says. But those who lack the qualities has become blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his former purification. When we believe the lie from the enemy... We make decisions for the now. When Paul says, keep your eye on the race for the prize to be had in the coming days, we make decisions that are, are, we feel are necessary right now. We're confused. We're short-sighted. We have lost our purpose, our identity, because we've listened to the lie. We're attempting to be like God. Television's on. We're going to work. It's all just in our head. Rage and rage and rage. And then we begin making decisions that are temporary. Look at Galatians 6, 7 through 9. For for what you plant, you will always will be the very thing you harvest. The harvest you reap reveals the seed that you planted. If you plant corrupt seeds of self-life into this natural realm, you can expect a harvest of corruption. If you plant good seeds of spirit life, you will reap beautiful fruits that grow from the everlasting spirit. Don't allow yourselves to grow weary in planting good seeds. Every decision we make, every emotional feeling that we dwell on, every thought that we allow real estate in our mind is a seed in the ground. We cannot sleep on life. If we hit the pause button, if we just lean back a second... We're going to plant seeds in our life that 10 years, 10 days, an hour, a half hour, we don't know. But the Bible says that if we plant seeds of corruption, we plant seeds of self-doubt, we plant seeds of low self-value, insecurity, I know. This year has been the hardest year of my life when it comes to how I feel. You can ask Natalie. I've sat plenty of times crying in bed if we lean away we begin to make short sighted decisions decisions that don't benefit us and where we're going we will reap a harvest it will begin to affect you it will affect your family it will affect everything around you and unintentionally Every thought, every decision matters. Look at this quote by John Bevere. The real threat is not our adverse circumstance, but the wrong beliefs and the thoughts that try to slip in during a hardship. The great Earl Nightingale says, our environment, the world in which we live and look, is a mirror of our attitude and expectations. We become what we think about. And if you plant seed in the ground and you don't think the way God has called us to think about ourselves, we will reap a harvest that the enemy is standing right behind us just to make it worse. 
Second lie. Second symptom, I should say. We read the word of God, but leave ourselves out of it as a beneficiary. Check this out, Matthew 7, 12. In everything you do, be careful to treat others the same way you would want them to treat you. In light of God's love for you specifically in everything that we talked about this morning, how we view ourselves is just as important on how we treat others. If we were, we were really good at guilting ourselves into loving others, but when it comes to us, we just don't think about it. It's 50-50 in that verse. It doesn't say, if you were really godly, it says, love others the way you would want to be loved. Oftentimes, I think we treat others badly because we don't love ourselves. But moreover, we don't cut ourselves any slack. It's easy to come to church and serve. But we're standing in a mirror 15 minutes before we got here. It's something different. Check this out. Ephesians 4.29, our youth group's verse. And never let ugly or hateful words come out of your mouth, but instead let words become beautiful gifts that encourage others and do this by speaking words of grace to help them. How about us? Let's read it this way. Never let ugly or hateful words come out of your mouth, but instead let your words become beautiful gifts that encourage you, that declare life over yourself. See, I know, when I was writing this, I thought, this is too much about us. This isn't, this shouldn't be taught. It's blasphemy. Because we should deny ourselves and love others. There's plenty of messages, and I still haven't got it after 30 years. I've heard all the other messages. If that one wasn't bad enough, let's try this one. 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak with the tongues of mankind and angels, but do not have love, let's read it different. If I speak with tongues of mankind and angels, but I don't have love for myself, I have become a noisy gong or clanging symbol. We cannot exclude ourselves. We become short sighted. You know what we'll become? Temporary. We'll cut our legacy short. We will diminish the prize set before us. I love this in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. We don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before weather clears and the sun shines bright. We will see it all then. We will see it all as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly as he knows us. just have to put context. There's plenty of messages about loving other people, about our due diligence as Christians, about rejecting sin and living purely. But today, this is about how we treat ourselves. Number three, symptom number three, we'll be distracted and unfulfilled in life. History has shown us that man has not stopped searching for the very thing that God started with. Instead of living our destiny, we live distracted, searching for what God has already promised and created in us. We're either striving to be great or we're beating ourselves down for nothing. We're either seeking love or avoiding it. We cannot live confidently if we're actively ignoring God's call to love ourselves as he first loved us. If we betray our mind, our self-esteem will suffer. To be aware of something but not apply it is the betrayal of our awareness and self-consciousness. Look at this verse, John 1.4. Thanks, Alan. We have come to know and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. You know what the final form is? Prayerlessness. When God, Jesus ascended to heaven, he said, I, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit as a comforter. That communion with God 
is called prayer, where we can maturate in the Holy Spirit, be spoken to and speak. The final form is prayerlessness, where we don't do either. Let's talk about three reasons why we are valuable. I pulled my pen out. Oops, I promise you it was here. Listen to this in Isaiah. Do you not know, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? He is understanding. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. See, the enemy won't let you think about this. He'll trap you. He'll make you, you'll you'll feel something, and then he'll make you feel bad about feeling that. It's like, hey, dude, you did this. He's like, oh, I can't believe you feel that way. (laughs) What if they knew about that? Do they know that you're experiencing those emotions? But God does not become weary or tired. When we are weary, he gives us strength. When we lack might, he gives us power. It says in 31, we will gain new strength and will mount up with wings of eagles. We will run and not grow tired. And we will knock, walk and not become weary. I love this. Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Don't be pulled into different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will guard your heart and your mind. We just got to be honest with God. When's the last time you told God, God, I am angry? I am hurt. I'm frustrated. See, line number three, the enemy's like, you better not pray to God in the condition that you are. He better not know that you're mad. He better not know that you're hurt. That's not the way you're supposed to look. That's not the way you're supposed to be like. You know that. You've been in church for 30 years. You can't be honest with God. If... If you pray again at the altar, everyone's going to see there's no margin to love ourselves or to be honest with God. But Philippians says, tell him every detail of your life. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will guard your heart and your mind. Through Jesus Christ, keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable. I I don't think we're truly honest with God. I think the enemy has us so bound up. We hate the way we are and we don't want God to see it or anybody else. Okay. Three reasons why you're valuable. Number one, you're valuable because of who you are. Ephesians 1.14, he chose us before the foundations of the earth. We who were chosen before God even laid the first stone. Genesis 1.26, we were made in the image of Christ. You can come that way. Second Peter, we are partakers of his divine nature. Try this one. Second Corinthians 3.18, we all can draw close to him with a veil removed from our faces. And with no veil, we all become mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of Jesus. It's wild that we are only reflecting the glory of God when we're not lying to ourselves or him. We're being honest with him and ourselves. 
And with no veil, we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory. We are being transfigured into his very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another. And this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord Jesus who is in the spirit. Psalms 139.14, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full and well. Isaiah 62, 2 through 4. Nations will see your victory vindication. And every king will witness your blinding radiance. You will be called a brand new name given to you from the mouth of Yahweh himself. You will be beautiful crown held high in the hand of Yahweh, a royal crown of splendor held in the open palm of God. You will never again be called abandoned one. Nor your land will be called deserted. But you will be called my delight is in you. My beloved, for, your, for Yahweh finds his delight in you and he married your land. Song of Solomon 4.9. This is God, Jesus, talking to us. For you reach into my heart, and with one flash of your eyes, I, Jesus, am undone by your love. My beloved, my equal, my bride, you leave me breathless. I am overcome by merely a glance from your worshiping eyes. You have stolen my heart. I am held hostage by your love, by the graces of the righteousness shining upon you. That's Jesus. What a description of what happens to Jesus when he looks into our eyes. Your worship brings him such delight that it becomes hard to imagine, yet God has placed inside you the ability to touch the heart of your king. We're valuable because of who we are. We're valuable because of what we cost. Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus, in the process of dying for all men, saving all of humanity, each and every one of us, regardless of who we are, where we came from, was able to communicate that every single one person would have been enough that he would leave the 99 for one. Each one of you is that one single person. Do you hear the enemy now? It's not true, it's not true, it's not true. You've heard this before, you've heard this before, you've heard this before. The enemy, even while we're reading scripture, will bark. this quote by J. Kenneth Grider. We were unworthy, not worthless. Jesus did not give his life for something worthless, but for them who had lives unworthy. <laughs> Romans 8, 32 through 35, he did not spare his own son. We're so valuable that God did not spare his own son, but he gave it up for us all. How will he not also along with him, graciously give you all things. Who will bring up any charge against those whom God has chosen? Is it, it is God who justifies. Who then condemns? No one. Christ died. More than that, who raised to life is at the right hand of God, also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness. Believing the lie will. <laughs> Reason number three, we're valuable. Because of what we can become. We have to learn to dream with the Lord again. 
I'm challenged when I ask myself, do I dream enough? Isla wakes up every day full of adventure and wonder. You ask kids what they want to be when they grow up. You ask us and we just say not to be growing up anymore, that's for sure. I think there's something wrong with that. That's why yesterday or Friday when Greg's like, hey, what are you doing for your birthday? I said nothing. Don't you think we should celebrate each other? Don't you think that we ought to think that we're worth celebrating? Come on, open our minds a little bit. Think. All of heaven, I've just got done reading. All of heaven bends down. We can wreck the heart of Jesus in love. We can't celebrate our own birthday. Romans 5, 17. <laughs> Sorry. All who receive God's abundant grace, empowerment. There's mercy and there's grace. Mercy is God forgiving us for what we did wrong. And grace is giving us a gift that we did not deserve. That is empowerment. All who receive God's abundance, grace, empowerment, are freely put right with him and will rule in life with Christ. We don't think that way anymore. Here's another translation. Death once held us in its grip. By the blunder of one man, death reigned as king over humanity. But now, how much more are we held in the grip of grace, empowerment, and continue reigning as kings in life, enjoying our regal freedom through the gift of his perfect righteousness in the one and only Jesus Messiah Deuteronomy 28, 13. God called us to be the head, not the tail. To be above, not below. We don't think this way anymore. For question, what does your life look like empowered by God? quote Chris Valentin Satan fears that the church will gain back her confidence and begin to restore our ruined cities he works overtime to tell us how weak the church is and how angry our father is with us all lies God humbles a man without degrading him and exalts him without inflating him The enemy works overtime. I don't think he's afraid of one person going to heaven. I think he's afraid of that person taking a whole lot of people with them. So when you wake up and you look in the mirror, the enemy is there to make sure that you know how pitiful you are, how broken you are, how wrong you are. should be doing better. Gosh. I wonder what the God is saying when we wake up. I know the Bible said he sings over us when we're sleeping. Luke 7, 28. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no greater than John the Baptist. Yet, one who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. Each one of us is greater than all that came before us. We are valuable because of what we can become. What if we started dreaming again? What does dreaming with God look like? What does it look like in your relationships? What do empowered relationships look like? What does dreaming with God in your finances look like? What 
does grace empowerment mean in your personal achievements? You know who was a great model of this? Was Daniel. I won't read it, but the Bible says that all of Judea was ransacked by Nebuchadnezzar. Best we know that Daniel's family was murdered or worse. He was taken to a land that was not his own, probably confused, a little angry at God. And it said that he was given opportunity to live in the palace at a high level. You know what short-sightedness would have done in that moment? I'm gonna eat some meat, drink some of this wine, and not do anything to get myself killed. That's what short-sightedness would do. I don't know what God's doing right now. Why is this happening? Why do I feel the way I feel? Bible says that Daniel resolved in his heart not to defile himself. I was having long, long sight. He knew there was something more. He knew that God was too good. So, in return, when he put his own heart, he didn't believe the lie from the enemy that said, Daniel, you're forgotten. God forgot about you. Everything you've lived for is not worth it. And you're justified feeling the hurt that you feel. You should be offended at God. When he re-sowed his heart back in the spirit, the Bible says that he woke up filled with wisdom and knowledge. Not wisdom and knowledge of just the scriptures, but the Bible says of literature in the area, science, math. He re his heart. And as James 1 says, I will fill your failures with grace. He was filled with grace empowerment and 2 x himself next himself. He became incredible. And when, so when I think about dreaming with God, I think, what are we missing out on? What's on the other side? I firmly believe that everything that we want in life is on the other side of the lie. It's just on the other side. All we have to do is receive what God has already given us. We don't have to try to be God. God wrote it on our heart. Isaiah 41.10 So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. I just want to dream with God again. I want our church to dream with God. I don't know what is on the other side for you, but I just can't get past that if we could just not believe the lie for once in our life, what awaits us on that other side. Look at this last verse. Isaiah 43, 18 through 19. Stop dwelling on the past. Don't even remember the former things. What if Adam did that in that moment? Before he chose to make decisions based on how he felt. Before he went into defense mode, he became short-sighted. He thought the best thing to do in that moment was to hide from God. Stop dwelling on the past. 
don't even remember the former things. I am doing something brand new, something unheard of. Even now, it sprouts and grows and matures. Don't you perceive it? Don't you see? I will make a way in the wilderness and open up flowing streams in the desert. I think half of this is having awareness of what truth is, what God's intentionality is. If you've been lied to a long time, sometimes you don't feel like you have an option. Sometimes you don't even know you're believing. So I think half of it's the awareness that there's a right way of thinking, there's a right way of feeling, there's a right way to believe about yourself that God in heaven has never changed. We've been lied to and we've robbed ourselves. We make decisions that we feel are just the best given the circumstances. And we plant seed in the ground that we have to reap a harvest of. We're so lost, spiraling out of control saying, where are you? I'm afraid. I'm afraid God will see me for who I am. I've always been afraid of the way that others perceive me. So we hide from God. And a month goes by, and a year goes by, and ten years goes by. We're stuck in the middle. We're afraid to admit what we've become. We feel pressure to feel of what we should be when all the time God is saying, who taught you to think this way? I'm searching for you on your level. I came to you. I know right where you are. Half of it is the awareness of what truth is. We have a right to see ourselves through heaven's eyes. The other side is legal. We've given the enemy access to our mind and our heart. And so I just want to pray. Can't you hear the enemy now? I think it would be awesome if we had people come up and tell God that they're angry. It's after our honesty with God that the Bible says he transcends our mind and goes to our heart. He becomes our defender. God's not afraid of you being angry. He's not afraid of you being bitter. All those seeds we've been planting, the Bible says that he can bring former and latter rain and restore everything that was lost. But we have to be honest with ourselves.
So if you just want to be honest with God, I want to pray. Alan and Jeff, if you guys want to be up here, if you just, if you want someone to pray, I'll tell you what, if you're angry at God, why don't you go to Jeff and just treat God as Jeff and say, I'm angry, I'm so bitter. If you want to pray then just come up right now let's just spend a moment in prayer while Natalie plays this song and be honest with God don't listen to the enemy you know what the enemy is telling me no one will come up it wasn't good and he's telling each of you something as well you deserve to be right. You deserve to feel right. Let's pray. If there is a lie, thank you, Jeff. If there is a lie that's been prevalent in your life, and you know it, I want you to come to me or Jeff, release the lie, and then let Jeff and I pray truth, a new way of thinking. If there's a lie that you are aware of, been in your life. Release that lie. Let us just speak truth 